Praise the Lord. Well, uh, as we continue to uh, finish off this series on uh, faith for the rapture, and uh, we're going to wrap this series up. And uh, we have many teachings on the uh, faith series. And in this series, we focus primarily how faith is necessary for the rapture, since we know uh, when the rapture takes place. And uh, since we are now gearing towards the end times, and we need end time faith. Even those uh, in the first generation that are not going to see the rapture, it is important to have this faith so that we can grow into the glorious church. And uh, that will be what God wants uh, to see. And these, in this uh, ending part of uh, the Faith for the Rapture series, we have taken from the book of Acts chapter 7, uh, chapter 6, where we talk about Stephen, a man full of faith. And that was in Acts chapter 6, in verse 5, Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And then it's repeated again in verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith. And very seldom is this uh, honor given to a man uh, who walks with God so close that they say he was full of faith. Even Jesus says, a little faith already a faith a grain of mustard seed can do so much this man was full of faith peter in matthew 14 he had a little faith when he was doubted, doubting uh, jesus and jesus said oh you of little faith to the thessalonians he says paul says you have grown your faith has grown exceedingly adjectives are added to faith strong faith little faith and uh, great faith and all these adjectives but here is uh, stephen is full of faith and uh, we were describing today how to be full of faith uh, in this end time so that there's no place for fear no place for anything except what God wants us to do which for Stephen he reached the fullness of his life he ended his life with full of faith and, uh, and then he even died as a martyr and add one more uh, one more reward to his life which is a martyr's crown so that what a tremendous life he lived and to end his life in that manner with great rewards uh, in the dimension of the spirit. Let's go to God as we continue uh, in this series and conclude even uh, in today's service. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Father. You are the God and the Father of faith. And in all that you do, you have faith in your own words. You have faith in us. And we ask, O oh God, that this deposit of faith that you place in our heart, this growing in faith, and this coming to the fullness of faith, would especially be established in our life as we understand the principles involved in being full of faith. So that you can call your people to the rapture, Lord. And you can bring all the first generation into the glorious church. We thank you, Father. We can be full of faith like Jesus was. He was the Word made flesh. He was full of the glory of God. We ask, Father, that even as we conclude this series, we ask that your Spirit will impart, transform, transfigure, change, and metamorphosize each one of us into your glory. Let your Word go forth like a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, removing all the darkness of sin in lives. Let your light shine through your word of faith that all the weights would be removed from every life, weights and distraction. That sin will be removed, O oh Father God. That all the impurities that are in lies will be removed and where strength is needed for the spirit, soul or body that you impart that strength, Father God that we have spiritual stamina we are full of the life of God we are full of your love full of your glory, Father we thank you, Father let your word seal this into each life confirm your word with signs following and we ask, O God, that you glorify Jesus once again for he indeed is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the life of our life. 
He is the faith of our faith. He is our blood, our flesh, our all in all. We are nothing without Jesus. So let the fullness of Jesus be established upon our lives. Thank you, Father. Blessing each one and glorifying Jesus. Bless all your angels through your word too. Bless everyone, Father. Let your glory and the love that you have for your creation and your blessings of faith go forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Now, let's pick up where we live this morning. Uh, and uh, first, we paint the picture again of um, the tabernacle of Moses. And uh, we uh, use uh, whatever we have here. Uh, this curtain and this uh, screen. Let's pretend that uh, this separates the holy place from the most holy place. And to enter the most holy place, you enter uh, into the second curtain. Then uh, this uh, pulpit, uh, we call it the altar of incense. And uh, it represents that. And up to this platform line is the uh, uh, holy place, uh, Moses Tabernacle or Solomon's Temple. And that uh, little table there uh, represents the table of showbread. And uh, then we have a uh, few more representations. And uh, one is um, the candlestick, which will actually be uh, exactly uh, alongside with, uh, uh, on the opposite side of the tabernacle of Moses, the Temple of Solomon, uh, to the table of showbread. But uh, both are at the side where the altar is incense nearer actually towards the uh, second veil. And then we have the lever. And inside everything is made from gold. Outside in the outer court, let this boundary of the platform be the uh, boundary of the separation from the outer court from the holy place. And then we have the lever, which is uh, uh, in the outer court where they wash the animal parts. And then where the camera is, and the camera stand represents uh, the uh, uh, Brazen altar, and uh, so uh, that's uh, all the six pieces of furniture. One, two, three, four, five, and uh, up inside. Now, bear in mind that the altar of incense uh, was originally supposed to be inside. So, in Solomon's temple and in uh, Moses' tabernacle, you have two pieces of furniture in the outside. Three pieces in the holy place and one in the most holy place, which is the Ark of the Covenant. So it's two, three, and one. But originally, it was two, two, and two, with the altar of incense inside the veil. And that scripture is taken from the book of Hebrews. We again draw the picture clearly and take off from where we left off in the book of Hebrews as uh, it describes all the pieces of the furniture that are there for them to present themselves before God in chapter 9 in chapter 9 of Hebrews verse 2 Hebrews chapter 9 verse 2 for a tabernacle was prepared the first part in which was the lampstand so there's a lampstand and then you have the table and on the table are 12 loaves of showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And then you see it was 3. Between 2 and 3, he never mentioned the altar incense. And then he says it was 3. Behind the second rail, hey, wait a minute, in, in the ex book of Exodus, it was before the second rail. But here he talks about it behind, not before. And those are two different places uh, in physical location. So here he's describing a picture of the one that is up there, that the real one that Moses saw. And uh, it was behind the second rail, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, holy of holies. So it cannot be mistaken. And he says there are two pieces there, it was four. The golden censer, and that's where the altar incense is, and the ark. So you notice that originally it was in the vision that Moses had was two pieces in the outer court, two pieces in the holy place, and two pieces in the most holy place. It was two plus two plus two. 
But why did it become 2 plus 3 plus 1? Because the priest have to attend to the insects. The insects doesn't burn for a whole year. They cannot power up the insects and burn until the whole year. The next year, you no know how many times they can go into the Holy of Holies once a day, once a year. So they cannot power enough insects for a whole year. How can you predict that? Uh, they cannot. And God, for the sake of accommodating our human inability to live in the Holy of Holies, where they can only enter once a year, He brought out the altar of incense, and anyway, the earth one is just a shadow. He brought it out, and, and they were supposed to put it near to the second grave. Like a symbol that it actually belonged inside. It just pushed outside the curtain. So it was near the, the, the second grave. Uh, second wheel, or just before it, and uh, that uh, uh, altar incense was pushed up because every day it needs attendance. They need to, to, to make, keep it clean, change the incense, refill it, and uh, all this, a lot of work to do every day in the temple. So God have to put it up because the priest needs to clean it and change the incense, same like uh, the lamp, uh, the, the lamp stand that was burning. And remember, all these are important. Sometimes you got a lazy priest who don't do his work. So the incense is going to go up. <laughs> and then all you have is smoke. No incense or whatever. And sometimes the lamp stand, it didn't take care properly. It's going to go up. It's going to go up. It's a horrible, isn't it? It's not supposed to go up. Right? Even right now, even we humans who are non-religious, you have the Olympic flame. You know Olympic flame is not supposed to go up. Right? Imagine if you have the Olympics, which is once every four years. And they want this, they are like, oh, boom! No, no, the flame goes out. <laughs> right. The lighting of the flame itself is a big ceremony for human beings. They run through the city, you know, take, uh, uh, take the torch, and then they take the plane, the, the flame in a plane, from one place to another, and all those things supposed to be burning somewhere in Greece. Um, so they cannot, and at one time, when the flame was going to go off, God has to, God has to ask, for help. And uh, I mean, God would send an angel to do that probably. And uh, uh, it's not so much that He needs help in heaven, it's the things that maintain His holiness. And uh, he, he called, Samuel, Samuel. You know why? Because God called, Eli, 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 too fat, too slow, <laughs> too deaf. <laughs> Cannot hear. Is it, it did that happen? Yes, I show you in the Bible. Actually, it all has to do with the lampstand. And uh, when there was a need and there's no human being there, God will even call a child. In the book of 1 Samuel. And uh, little Samuel was just helping around. And uh, in the book of uh, 1 Samuel, chapter 3, it tells us here that Samuel did not know the Lord yet. And then it says, verse 3, Before the Lamb of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord. Can you see that? Eli was not a good priest. He didn't take care of the temple properly. In fact, he allowed his children to mess up the offering. When people were offering the offering, and you know that God already says certain portion is for the priest. So while he was still burning or finished, they come and say, this lamb is mine. They thought the temple of God was the kitchen. They want to know so what the, who knows? If we were modern day what the cooking cooking, then you put your what's the thing there was a campfire? Skewer. Uh, that's skewer and the, 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 the like, toast uh, marshmallows. The toast and marshmallows. Oh, you can't do that! This is, you cannot toast your marshmallows! Uh, inside the offering, what they burning on the offering, everyone you know, the the poor people, the, 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 some of them are so poor they have to buy an animal or whatever in order to sacrifice and pointing to Christ. You know, the priest will be marshmallow. Yeah, I tell jokes. <laughs> 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 you know? Once in a while, they want a bit more fragrance. Take the marshmallows, go to the altar inside. Uh, say, hey, my one more fragrant. Uh, this fire better. <laughs> what well, like you think the whole temple was your kitchen? So. The problem was this the priest that he didn't train his sons, children, his sons supposed to be trained as priests. And uh, so not training them properly. And God looks around, there's no one. 
and you cannot call the uh, Eli's son because they are just not spiritually aware. And God has to call one tiny little boy who probably his height cannot reach the candlestick. I don't know how he did that. And, uh, and where was Eli? Eli sound asleep. <laughs> Eli! Eli! <laughs> the Bible did say he was very fat. And uh, so I assume he also snored. Now, not all fat people snore, no? Excuse me, if your, if your fatness is due to genetics, we are well apologetic. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, don't, don't, don't judge a person by their size, right? Now, all of you don't keep looking at Eddie, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, so, uh, it's important for us to understand that God was calling and he has to call, he has to call little Samuel. He Samuel, and then Samuel came. So, some of us don't see the detail. The detail, which actually when Eli woke up, then Eli must be realized, oh, why is it so dark here? Do you know the only light in the, in everything was closed by curtain. The only light you have is the candlestick and then the altar inside. So in the candlestick, which is actually a flame, and what is the incense one? It just will be coals and burning the incense. Uh, it's very dark inside. So if it goes off, very dangerous. You know, look, hey, hey, I can't see where's the show <laughs> He knocked down the incense altar, knocked down the candlestick, knocked down the table of show I think how displeased God will be. Right? Cannot I come see please, please or so? You need a light to see properly to know where you're going. So all these things I'm going to call Samuel. Good thing Samuel going to wake up Eli and finally the Lord spoke to him many days. Now what the Lord spoke to him was prophecy and the prophecy was judging Eli. And sometimes the Lord used natural thing. The land going up was the final straw. And since God is about camel, we cannot really break the camel's back. <laughs> But it's the final straw that God cannot tolerate anymore. This is uh, the way they treat the, the temple, the tabernacle. So there is this uh, places there, but here is where we do the counting. Originally, auto incense was supposed to be inside, so it's 2 plus 2 plus 2. So here's a strange thing. It is outside in the Solomon Temple and in the uh, tabernacle of Moses, and it was inside in the one mentioned by Hebrews, which is the one up in heaven. There's, a, there's some pattern that Moses saw up there. There's a spiritual pattern. So it's 2 plus 2 plus 2, not 2 plus 3 plus 1. And for that reason, you count the altar of incense twice. 2 plus 3, but since that one had 1 inside 2, then plus 2. Now, 2 plus 3 plus 2 plus 7. And you need 7. Because by counting auto incense twice, you got the number seven. <laughs> okay, thank you. I was wondering whether you noticed that. Right? This is not seven, right? Ah, that is seven. Okay. <laughs> that is seven. So by counting, counting seven, it is how we tie it to the seven feet. So today we're going to tie the seven, but before we, we do it, remember your, your, your basic understanding of the tabernacle. The brazen altar is where the blood is poured and shed. And each one represents a spiritual principle. So the brazen altar represents the power of the blood. Everything points to Jesus. Jesus is our DNA. The power of the blood. The level where they wash the animals, entrail, entrail especially God mentioned entrail. Because everything was a symbol. Entrails talk about the innermost parts of our being. And uh, so they wash the entrails and kidneys and all those things of the animal to bring as an offering before God. The lever was said they can. Now, water, I know, can symbolize the spirit. But water also symbolized the word. In uh, Ephesians 5, Jesus cleansed the church with the washing of water of the word. And when they, when they talked about he that come by water and by blood, it's not talking about he that come by uh, just by blood, and, but it's also by the word and by the spirit. And first John talked about the three witnesses in heaven and on earth. You notice the word is one of them. So uh, the level actually represents the power of the word. The word cleanses. 
The word renews, the word washes. The power of the word is to cut and to uh, uh, cleanse and take away things that are wrong out of our life. So the word is powerful. Jesus also said in John chapter 15 verse 3, My word has made you clean. So the word has cleansing power. That's the lever. So there's power of the word. And then the candlestick, all of us know the power of the Holy Spirit. And all the nobles, knobs and all that represent all the different key things of the Holy Spirit. And uh, then the table of showbread, uh, with 12 low 12 is the number of government and uh, uh, rulership. And uh, then the table was also special. It has like, uh, it's pointed at the end. So it almost looks like a crown when you look at different direction. So it talks about uh, uh, the kingship of Jesus, which is the power of the name of Jesus. And then the altar of incense uh, speaks about the power of prayer and uh, praise. And uh, then the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the power of uh, the presence of God. The Ark represents the presence of God. So each one represents a principle. And of course, uh, there's prayer here in the holy place and worship here, but then there's prayer and worship inside also. And uh, so it's a different dimension. So there are two dimensions of uh, the altar insects, remember, to make it seven. You count like one, two, uh, three, uh, one, two, then you count uh, uh, three, four, uh, five, six, five and six. This is five and six because it goes in and then seven. Each part also represents Jesus. Uh, where the blush is shed, the brazen altar is Jesus the Lamb. And the lever is Jesus the Word of God, made flesh. The candlestick, Jesus the giver of the Holy Spirit, baptized the Holy Spirit. The table of showbread, Jesus King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Altar of incense, Jesus our High Priest. And what does a High Priest do? He brings you uh, from where you are into the presence of God. So that's why it's come back at number five and number six. It enters in, and uh, Jesus, our high priest and our mediator, and uh, the ark of the covenant, Jesus, the fullness of God. So each piece points to Jesus, and uh, then the altar incense is counted twice. It's both number five and number six. Look at the book of Leviticus, chapter twenty-three. We lay all the groundwork. Leviticus, chapter twenty-three. Leviticus 23, the seven feasts, again, it says here, these are the feasts of the Lord in verse 4, and there are seven feasts. Uh, one actually is a fast, but there are seven important occasions, celebrations. In verse 5, chapter 23, verse 5 of Leviticus, on the 14th day of the first month is the feast of Passover. And in verse 6, on the 15th day of the same month, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So, Feast number 1 and Feast number 2 are joined together. In fact, when they present themselves once a year for that feast, there are three times that they appear before the Lord. They come at one go for Feast number 1 and 2. So, the Israelites make a journey all the way to celebrate. Uh, Passover is a personal one, then they come for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So they enjoy the personal Passover in their home, then they come for the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 15th day of the month. So there are 14th and 15th day of the first month. And so both Feast number 1 and 2 are related. And uh, so Feast number 1 is the Passover related to the brazen altar. Passover, the blood. And so that's feast number one. I relate all the seven feasts to all these six pieces of furniture with altar incense counted twice. So it relates to the brazen altar. So you can have that in notes. And then the brazen altar ties with the celebration of the 15th day of the month, the feast of unleavened bread. And uh, that one has to do with the word. And uh, so the celebration of the feast and living bread again represent the purity of God's word. So it's tied together. Feast, feast number one and two is tied to uh, furniture number one and number two. And then you have the next one is the first fruits in verse 9 and 10. 
when you come into the land, you plant the harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits. Now, the first fruits uh, that begins to come, and uh, that's the beginning of the harvest, is represented, the feast of first fruits is tied to the Lord blessing them, he's the king of kings, lord of lords, all they plant in his name, they reap in his name, and uh, it is tied to all the blessings of what the table of showbread represents. Now the table of showbread also represents <coughs> nourishment for the priests. <coughs> See, it's like that. <coughs> nourishment. Thank you very much. <coughs> so the bread is missing. Right. <coughs> Communion and all this revolve from here. <coughs> when you say that, now key say that. Offer to God bread and wine, <coughs> table of showbread. He was also called the King of Peace. King of Salem, which is peace. It's a derivation of Shalom. So here, he said the peace reigns and eats in the holy place. And the bread is supposed to be for the priest. There was only one time in the Bible that somebody else ate it who was not a priest. King David. And they were conditioned. The priest said, Hey, are you sanctified? Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah. And then, then he, he was allowed because he was hungry. And uh, so the table of showbread ties to the feast of first fruits. The feast of Pentecost ties to the candlestick. From the time of the first fruits, you count 50 days. God told them in uh, Leviticus 23. It says here that uh, it was 15. You shall count for yourself after the Sabbath, from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you bring the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. So, 1 plus 49, 50 days. So, in 16, count 50 days. Count 50 days to the day after the first fruits. That will be your Feast of Pentecost, which is Feast number 4. Notice something. Feast number 3 and feast number 4 are related. They are all related in numbering. The moment that occurs, the countdown begins to 15. And the moment the Passover counts, the next day will be the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Both same month. And so feast number 4 and 5 are related. Feast number, feast number, uh, feast number 3 and 4 are related. Feast number 5, 6 and 7 are related. Because feast number 5, in feast number 5, you have in verse 24, chapter 23. Speak to the children of Israel, say, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets. They're just sounding the trumpets. And uh, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So it was uh, an important day. For them and they, they, they make all the announcements and they were just calling on the trumpet sound. Holy congregation means the people have to be gathered together. It's holy day. That is the first day of the seventh month. Verse 27. On the tenth day of the seventh month is the most holy day in the whole year. The day of atonement. That's the day that the high priest goes in to the most holy, most holy place. And he only got a few minutes inside the most holy place. So that is feast number six. But it's not a feast, it's really a fast. It's called Yom Kippur in our in our modern Hebrew so that they celebrate. Even though they don't have a tabernacle, they celebrate. Yom Kippur, they fast on that day. And uh, and it's the most holy day. That's feast number six. It's the entrance into the Holy of Holies. It's a holy day. And that's done on the 10th day of the 7th month. And when that is all finished, over the next few days, on the 15th day of the same month, 7th month, verse 34, they celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So, Feast number 5, 6, and 7 are, are all done in one month, the 7th month. First day of the month, 10th day of the month, 15th day of the month. And 
So those three are related. The outer incense and the outer incense again inside represents two of those feasts. It represents the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. And of course, the Ark of the Covenant represents God's presence with us, the Feast of Tabernacles. Can you see that? Five and six are in the outer incense. Number seven are in the Ark of the Covenant. So we related seven to seven. Seven feasts to seven furnitures with uh, number five and six counted twice to make seven. And the seven feasts are also related to the blessings of the seven churches. Let's have a look. This morning we didn't have time for that, but now we have a revelation to all the blessings of the seven churches. You have in the first church, Ephesus church. And we look at the promises to the overcomers. That's where it ties together. And uh, in chapter 2, looking at uh, verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That ties, the efficient church ties to the brazen altar. And so the brazen altar is where you first eat of the tree of life. You enter the relationship with God there. You partake of Jesus, the tree of life. And then begin your walk with God by the blood of the Lamb. The efficient church. And uh, the lever is represented by the church in Smyrna. Look at the promises given in verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Why? Because the word in your life is greater than heaven and earth. Heaven and earth will pass away. But if the whatever parts of you are synchronized, are be, become part of the word, it is eternal. Even the heavens will pass away, but the word will not pass away. And so it points again to the word of God that comes forth from God. That makes you immortal to even the second death. And if you understand how to do it, immortal to the first death, which is physical death too. Immortality comes through the word made flesh. Then why did Jesus die? Because he chose to. Do you know that when Jesus was killed, even though he took all sicknesses upon himself on the cross, you know, he, you know all our griefs and all our sins, some people imagine, oh, every sickness in the world, those that, that we have known, those we don't know, those undiscovered, all had to be on him. Have to be, because any missing means cannot cure. So nothing must be missing. But if you pile all the sickness on Jesus physically, it does not mean when Jesus died on the cross, then he got cancer, he got leprosy, he got gout, he got... You pile the sickness, it will be a mountain. So Jesus doesn't have to actually physically develop cancer while on the cross to bear your cancer. Jesus doesn't have to actually develop leprosy, so his hands started dropping you know, to, 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 to bear your leprosy. No, he has to bear the root of all sickness, which is sin. And the part of sin that caused all sicknesses and disease from the fall of Adam, he bear the legal basis of it and is covered. So as far as Jesus' physical body was concerned, it was actually sickless, no, no symptom of sin. That when they took him down and there was just his body without life, the Bible says in the book of Acts 2, he does not let the Holy One to see corruption. There was not, during the three days, while Jesus' body was in, waiting in the tomb to be collected, not a single worm or germ there to touch the, touch the body. Why do you think, you know, when someone died three days already, we smell it. Don't talk about seven days. That's how the 
CSI people diagnose how long a person had died. You know how they, they diagnose? By counting the size of the worms. Or how much decay. Then they can trace back, okay, roughly when, by when, uh, how long the person had, had, had been died, had been dead. And uh, so that's how they count. And uh, so Jesus' body inside the tomb, no germ, bacteria, virus also there to touch. Why, why you think Jesus three days his body start rotting? You know all the worms eating up. Then maybe some worms eat his eyeball. <laughs> then Jesus come back. And you happen to my body. You don't mind when they collect your body. You know? So all the germs seem run away, but they already eaten part of the body. So Jesus got out of the whole No way I'll restore the whole. No way. No corruption. He died legally for us. He did lost all the sickness of but there was no sickness and disease. You know why? He was the word made flesh. Maybe someone tried to bite him. He goes, ah! Worm <laughs> <laughs> died. Cannot even go near. Maybe some bacteria, some flies, come. Yeah. And there's some sort of electric field barrier. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if it was fly season, let me you know, here's what I'll tell you, it was, there were still some flies there. So, and, uh, so you should see our, uh, the other day, we always know I teach you, you should see the prophet on the first day. Uh, he walked here's rock. Mm-hmm. And then after we walked far, you know, well, most of us were wiping the flies away. Uh, so I bring the flies away and then the prophet gets a piece of branch. So the prophet walks on it. <laughs> Should have taken a picture. Yeah, we did not take a picture of the prophet with his branch. The flies swatted. So that's why they end up wearing a hat and, and with that. They cover it. Others, you know, if you're walking, climbing, then you, you need one hand here, you They say, oh, oh, the other hand. <laughs> so that wouldn't be good. In the audio hands. And uh, so, so I mean the flies. So, the flies cannot come near Jesus' body because it was still preserved. It was a legal transaction. A legal transaction. You can buy a muddy piece of ground, but you could be signing uh, uh, the legal transaction in a clean place. And it's still legal. And it, actually, that is more powerful than the actual land that you measure. And uh, so, that's in a sense. So Jesus died legal. He was the word made flesh. And nothing could touch a physical body. He has already transacted it in the spirit. His blood was the payment for all our sickness and disease. So by his blood we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. Because when the stripes are on him, the blood flow. We are healed by his stripes. So that was Jesus. He did become sin for us. The fact that God has to cut off uh, just for that moment. And he said, you know, my God, my God, why has not forsaken me? God forsook him, that was enough. Cut off, forsook. For just that moment, six hours on the cross, that was enough. And so, Jesus was the word made flesh, and that was uh, immortality, as we are saying. The word makes you immortal. The word can become our flesh. The word can come into your bones and your marrow. Hebrews chapter 4 was shown. Your marrow is where stem cells are produced. Uh, The word can give you immortality. The word is your beauty treatment, ladies. (laughs) Yes. So, but don't every morning tear pieces with your Bible. (laughs) It is the concept of the word in your thinking in your heart, in your mind, right? The one printed one, no, right? it's also powerful, but I don't think it's supposed to be used that way. So then after 365 days, you find your Bible missing 365 pages. <laughs> I've been mean, using different sections. That's it. Then if you talk to me, I would say, oh, you use every chapter. Where do you start? Genesis chapter 1. Oh, but one page got Genesis 1 and 2. So second page was what? Oh, chapter 3 and 4. Okay, but do you also use the Deuteronomy 28 one, the one from verse 13 to the end day? You use that? Oh, which day of the month was that? Oh, oh dear! That one contained all the sickness! 
Hey, you took with it on. So anyway, no, no, you're supposed to use the word, but all the promises in the word. So you don't use the curse of the law. You put in the curse. That means that no wonder that side all the gut or the sin disappear. But no, you don't physically use the word in that way. But that is the word of God that we that the power of the word of God. The church of Smyrna. Now you already notice two things. Ephesus is the angel of peace. Smyrna is the angel of love. So you have peace with God, having been justified by faith. You have peace with God and love. Having peace with God, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. Romans chapter 5. Peace, love, everyone should receive it. But then you've got to go further. The third church, and that is uh, Church of Pergamos. Church of Pergamos, represented by the table of showbread, by the Feast of First Fruits. And it says here in Revelation chapter 2, and uh, in the promises, it was 17, and says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. Uh, it ties to the showbread. Because who can eat the showbread? In fact, the common people might not even see the showbread. It's hidden from their eyes. It is hidden behind the first veil. Only the priests see it. And only the worshipping priests and Levitical priesthood make the showbread. So it's like hidden manna, but it's something they eat. You partake of the authority and the kingship of Christ. And uh, then you're given a stone. On the stone, a new name, which no one knows except him. You're given your own special call, your own special work, your own special anointing. Here is where, uh, in the outer court, and let me divide it again. In the outer court is a personal reception. In the inner court, a holy place, you're receiving for others. You're becoming a blessing. In the outer court, you're blessed. In the inner court, you become a blessing. So there you receive for yourself. Here you receive blessing for yourself and for others. You become a blessing. And uh, in the most holy place, you're the source of all blessings. And then, how does it relate to faith? We're talking about how to be full of faith. You have to be full of faith, not from the outside in. When, when Stephen was full of faith, it's from his spirit, soul, and body. So, faith comes in your spirit and must flow through your soul, flow through your physical body. It must uh, completely fill you. Full and then there's no more place. And God can transform you. And uh, let's put it in terms of faith. The outer court is exercising faith for yourself. The holy place is exercising faith for others. The most holy place is exercising faith in your relationship with God. And that is the, the, that is, that is the greatest thing I can tell you. Because many Christians use their faith to become richer physically, to live in a bigger house, to drive a bigger car, to do physical things and they are only exercising their faith for the outer court. They will all pass away when this will finish. Then there are Christians who exercise their faith for others. You believe God for souls. You believe God for, for gifts in order that you function the gifts to bring blessing to others. So you function in the Holy Spirit and anointing. You function in the authority of the believer. You know, power the name. is. You, you need faith too. And as you grow in faith there, you also become a blessing with a greater authority exercise. And then your ministry of prayer and worship, uh, as you gain faith in how to pray, pray successfully, and, and then you pray for nations, you pray for the, your faith, you exercise for others. But then there's another level of faith. Faith in the holy things of God. Faith for how to get into God. Not many Christians exercise their faith to go deeper in God. From the early days of my Christian life, I exercise my faith to get deeper into God. I ask God, I want to walk with you like Enoch walked with you. From 1979, let me see what the date was. 
uh, it was 1979, August, started meditating. And 30 odd years, I said, I want to walk with you like Elon and be translated. So I exercised my faith in my relationship with God. God answered. And then I exercised my faith and I said, God, I want to be the person who walk closest to you on the planet Earth. And God, teach. That's why by His grace, again, it's by His gift of faith and His grace, that that faith I did not use to make myself richer. In fact, when God blessed me in the early days when our ministry was big and we were selling thousands of tapes, you know, our weekly offering was about 20, 30,000. And that's not church offering, that's my personal offering. And we use that to bless a lot of people. We pay for the houses of our co co-workers, we, we, we rent places also that they can start off and all those. And, uh, and start, we had a lot of visitors from all over the place, people from India, all over visited us on church for thousand over. And sometimes they came with me and said, hey, you live in a simple house, drive a simple car, you know, you could be very rich. I said, I agree, I could be very rich. But I did not use all my money for myself. And uh, so, uh, instead, there are other things that I treasure. Remember, I told, told the story about how uh, I received a signed blank check. And at that time, I was already learning how not to, to use your faith for your own selfish end. And I asked God, look what to do, like, to do about it. And the person who gave me, I had a lot of money. If I had written for 10,000, 100,000, it would have cleared. And uh, of course, if someone give, give you a blank sign check, the thing is, depend on who the person is. Right? <laughs> 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 yeah. He said, hey, this person actually only got about 50 bucks in the bank. So definitely you cannot write more than 50 bucks. You only need one check, remember? You write that one month finish. And so, I could, but the Lord told me, this is only for what you pray. You know, thank you. And say, and, and I, I recall what I prayed. I only prayed for washing machine. And at that time, in Penang and the washing machine, I think it cost about 900 something. So I wrote a round check of 1,000. And I informed the person again. I said, look, first of all, when I saw the blank check, I said, is this a mistake? So I called this one. Is this a mistake? And was there the mom that he wanted to put? And the person said, nah, uh, the Lord told me to do this. Wow, the Lord. Thank you very much. Because, <laughs> you know, then, so the time, so I wrote 1,000 and I, and I uh, uh, told the person to give. Uh, he was a dear couple, still good friends, and said, uh, uh, this is the amount you wrote so that you know how much was clear and how this check cleared. And so we use that money for the washing machine. Because some of you say, Ah, oh, yeah, give it to me. I've <laughs> you know, done a lot of things. You could have bought a house, a car, you could have bought, you know, uh, fill up the whole house, finish the whole house, and then, uh, and then sign yourself for a year's or free meal or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that is why you never got such a check. Because <laughs> God knows you're going to misuse it. So we cannot use, uh, some people use their faith or the wrong channel. You got to use your faith to get closer and nearer to God. And that's why in the book of Hebrews it tells us, you know, enter boldly into God. Use your faith for spiritual things. Use your faith for things that are eternal. By all means, you know, use your faith for simple things like, you know, give this daily a daily bread or things that you need. By all means, use your faith. But don't use all of your faith there. Your faith should be used in your relationship with God. Because these are eternal things. These are things that money cannot buy. And so when I use the faith to walk close, my aim is to walk closest to God. Walk on earth. And God grant that wish. So I am both first generation and second generation. And second generation, and I was teasing, I was sitting, I, I, we had a good fellowship in, 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 in Sydney. So they all came to my house and we got all the community of second generation to come and I cooked for them. Somehow, within a few hours, Pastor David knew that I cooked 10 dishes. <laughs> well, you second generation communicate so fast. <laughs> <laughs> you just, 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 
He said, hey, I haven't even got time to sit down and email he announced. <laughs> so I found that it was from second generation to second generation to second generation, to second generation, to second generation and then gone to our seven thunders prophet. <laughs> anyway, it was okay. And, uh, so you know, they all came to the house and we cooked. We had, uh, I cannot beat Lydia's. You got 10 dishes, right? I cannot beat your 10 dishes. So we had macaroni and cheese with chicken. We had a bolognese, a spaghetti bolognese, and, uh, and a new special spaghetti called Angel's Hair. I think you got that here. At least a bit more biblical. <laughs> and, uh, then, uh, and then we had sweet and sour uh, char siu chicken. And then we had, I better don't go too much after, okay, please wipe the saliva from your face right now. <laughs> so anyway, we are all those things. And then when we are sitting there talking, uh, talking about things of God and teaching them at the same time. And then I think, look, you know, uh, this is going to take place and all that. So we are talking about rapture and talking about transition. So I say, one of these days, then some of them, the young fellows, some of the young and they are created somewhere in the 20s. So they can't think, wow, oh, if Jesus come in 50 years, 60 they come how old they were. So they can't think, say, wow, oh, I'll be 76. So then they say, wow. Oh, I will be 80 something. So they will come take, come take. And so I see that. So some of them, because they're pretty young and fire standards take a long time. So they say, oh, I will be very old. You know? Of course, some of you here are in your 50s, 60s, you know, 70s is like nothing. Right? But the young people to them, and, and they come take, oh, 76, lao lang, very old. And so they will come take. And then one of the things they say, well, I think all of you might grow older than me. Physically, they might grow older. So they say, oh, what is that? Say, because if you don't tap upon the anointing of God, the glory of God, no, you guys are going to be older and older and older. So uh, before the rapture, you know, I'm going to look younger than you. Ah, oh, that was the secret. That was the secret. And today is the secret. <laughs> That's why you're talking about how to tap on the anointing of God for the rapture. And also for those of you in first generation, you don't want to go home to God, you know, or, uh, walking with three tongkan. <laughs> so you might do it, you know, one on each hand and the other tied to your back so you don't fall backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, you want to walk with Moses. Walk with Moses. Uh, walk like Moses did 120 years, they can climb on that. 120 years, still a good eyesight, good health, strength. And he was he was the picture of the Old Testament. And by the grace of God, I was chosen to be the picture of the New Testament. Wow, oh, thank you, God. I'm so thankful that I say, God, I don't know what to give you. I cannot give you money because you own the whole world. I cannot uh, now do anything. But one day I can give you, I will fast every Thursday as Thanksgiving for the rest of my life. Right, it's big. So when everything is over, then the other worlds will hear about the stories on earth and how the church grew, how from the Old Testament, the humans have walked with God and how we grow. Our stories will be there. Just as we look at the story of Moses, they will look at our earth stories and learn. So again, I encourage you, your story is still being made. Like we read about how some of the mighty men of David Physically, they fought David and Goliath's story. We all love that. It was not a story. It was a real thing. Some of you are going to create great stories for the universe to talk about. Other planets. Use your faith for great things in God. <coughs> to press deeper into God. And so, in terms of faith, that outer God faith, it's faith for yourself. And of course, there's the starting place. I understand everyone starts from there. Everyone has needs when they come to Christ. And then, inner cough, play, faith, or holy place faith, is faith for others. Holy of holies. It's where you learn to use your faith to walk with God and His angels. That's a dimension I'm trying to teach. So I'm going to finish this before I teach another series. And so we have. Now where are we up to? We are up to the third church. And uh, 
the third church is uh, the church of Pergamos. And the blessing of this church, the hidden manna, the white stone. And don't forget, here is where the glory begins. There is peace, love, the glory of God. So we are learning about the glory of God. And for Jesus to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords, He must be King of Kings and Lord of Lords in your life. Savior not enough, Savior or outside. When you come in, your life belongs to God. He must be your master, your Lord, and you are His servant. And you learn that without Him, you cannot do anything. So if Jesus is our master and we're just His born slave, will we dare to do anything without Him? No, right? Never. You will never do one thing without the master's uh, consultation or command. That's how much we must come to obedience in Him. Humility is the key. Because some of us, if we got one of the things that we can answer that question, you know why not many human beings can exercise great power in God and why God don't simply give great power? Because God cannot trust them with the power. It will be abused. Already there are stories in the body of Christ. People with great gifts of healing, they, in the end, even though at one time they dedicated to God, they turn it into selfishness and use it to profit for money. Merchandise the anointing. Or dominate over people's life. All these are abuse of power. Spiritual power turn into selfish ends. And God cannot trust us with your power. So God will only, after passing certain tests, now the sad thing is, after passing tests, you qualify, you got it, then you might still abuse it because you don't know how to remain dead in Christ. So imagine if God give you power to call down fire. When, you know, every time you need fire, you need fire. It misused. It was for specific purpose. Not simply to play around with. God cannot trust some of us with this power. That is why there's so much testing, so much proving. And the good news is this. We are reaching the point where God really wants to release His power. He cannot help. These are the end time He wants to release His power. But the thing is, can He trust us with His power? You know Jesus got so much power. He, he could turn stones into bread. And some of us, if you could have turned stones into bread, the rest of your life you will never work. <laughs> you want to eat, you just go pick up a big nice rock and then... <laughs> Since it's turned by God, I assume all the vitamins and nutrition must be there. Why do you think when you when it's turned by God's power, you know, it lacks vitamin? Then you eat, then you get scurvy because there's no vitamin C inside. <laughs> or whatever. No, it, it has to be. Jesus had the power, but he did not use it. He, you know, imagine the power to turn stones into bread. Could you imagine some of the things people will do. They start a bread shop. <laughs> <laughs> so on one side, all the rocks came in. On the other side, all the freshly bread, bread come to the front. What? No need anyone. They just sit there. Shh. You know? Shh. No, so after the one, they learn how to turn everyone. Like, Shh. And all the bread goes out. Right? We've been misusing all those things. So we have to learn to handle the glory of God. The angel of glory. And then, angel of power, Thyatira, candlestick, which is tied to Pentecost. In uh, the church of Thyatira, in uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 26, He who all comes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And notice, power here related to that too. These two are related. And the relationship is still there. Because the two develop together. And uh, the angel of Taitira is the angel of power. And then, 5 and 6, uh, the church of Sardis and the church of Philadelphia. These two in the altar of incense. Uh, verse 5, He who all come shall be clothed in the white garment, I will blot out his name. Uh, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my father, before his angel. Now look, 
you are well known to the Father and to the angel. Your prayer has power. Your power with God and with man. Your power with angel. God has to trust you with this. I, this is the way I call it. The, the promise. This is the auto incense. Power with God. A power to, to enter into the holiest of God. And the Philadelphia Church. It says in verse 12. He who all comes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go up no more. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of my city, of my God, uh, the Jer new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven. I will write him my new name. In other words, you become the temple of God. So on one side you're giving, the other side you're actually bringing the presence of God down. So, five and six, all the incense. And card number seven is the mercy seat. Now, the angel of uh, Sadis is the angel of life. Angel of Philadelphia is the angel of wisdom. And you need the wisdom of God and the life of God. And when the life of God is in you, it's a very powerful place to be. Because you can release blessings of life. And with the wisdom of God, and remember this enters into the, the dimension. This wisdom God tells you what you can do and you can't do. Very important dimension of faith. I'll show you some examples of faith used in God uh, through the wisdom of God. And you know how to handle the things of the wisdom of God. In chapter, uh, let me finish with chapter 3, uh, verse 21. To him that overcomes, I will come to sit with me on my throne. That is the mercy seat. And the angel, let me say, the angel of See how it ties together? The DNA flows right through. And uh, we also mentioned that all the seven feasts all ties to where we are. It, the seven feasts that they celebrate every year point to some things in the spiritual that God was going to do. Seven great things God was going to do. From the Old Testament, it was a shadow. And those things have already occurred. And uh, we work backwards first. From uh, the book of Revelation 21, and this we mentioned in the first service, we mentioned here for the second service, for those of you who are here. In chapter 21, uh, verse uh, 3, at the end of everything, even after the millennium, it says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. He will dwell with us. That is the day when God comes down on a new heaven and new earth. This earth is renewed. That is Number seven, the Ark. And the Ark of the Covenant represents the Feast of Tabernacles. God's presence come down in His fullness. And as I mentioned, there are seven states of heaven that the angels have known for billions of years. Paul went to the third heaven. And that coming down is like something like, for heart, like a word to describe, something like the eighth heaven. And what happened? They had never been seen before. So it's something that God wanted to do. When He's finished all this, uh, He finished everything, but then the fall of man, everything has to be redone. And when He finished uh, removing all sin and rebellion of Satan from the universe, the tabernacle of God's remain. The Satan, by that time, is also thrown into the lake of fire. And uh, so there's the tabernacle. And then uh, you have also uh, uh, in, the, in the Bible certain important points. Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost. Why God choose that day? Because that was the day. The celebration of the Pentecost was a physical feast. But it pointed to the day the Holy Spirit would come down to the earth and start the church age. So in Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost and fully comes, see, God chose very carefully. Because that symbolized the beginning of the church age. In a sense, the church age began in Pentecost. The church age began in Pentecost. That is why in the, in the seven churches, you see the lampstand, correct? In Revelation 1, what do you see? Lampstand. John saw lampstand. Because the church age begins at Pentecost. So what about the other feasts? When Jesus died on the cross and gave himself for us, he was the Passover. Passover has finished. And 
He was also the feast of unleavened bread. He is our bread of life. So Jesus died on the cross for his three days when he went to the pits of hell for us. Represent the feast of Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. Remember, they are all connected, only one day difference. So two feasts have been fulfilled in the spiritual world. It will never be repeated. We all only need one passport. We are not Jews. The Jews celebrate it. And even the Jews was a shadow. The Old Testament is revealing the New, but it's all in shadow. It's Old Testament in, in the New Conceal. The New is the Old Reveal. It, they were pointing to Jesus without knowing it. Jesus did only to die once. The Lamb of God need to die once. The animal lamb, they die every year. Pointing to Jesus to die once. The spiritual Passover, my friend, is over. Spiritual feast of unleavened bread over. But we celebrate the communion of supper to remember the feast. What Jesus has done. The lever, the, the lever and the Passover, these two are done. So, these two feasts are done in Jesus. The first fruits. When Jesus rose from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible is so accurate that it even names this feast without us realizing he's naming the feast. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, talks about the resurrection of Jesus. In verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead. He's the first born from the dead. And then after that, everyone else born again. And he says, He is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits. So when Jesus was risen from the dead, first fruits was over. Of course, first fruits mean that many other fruit that Jesus bore. In him, we bear much fruit. But the first fruit was fulfilled when he rose from the dead. Jesus did only to rise one time. The resurrection power continues until he comes again. That is why when we sing the song, he is risen from the dead. The actual words is not he has, it's he is. He remains risen and that's it. One time, he is risen from the dead. And so he is risen from the dead. And in all the sermons that are preached in the New Testament, there's one thing, the resurrection of Jesus. So we keep pointing that we have the life of God, we have the power of God because of the resurrection of Jesus. We have the Passover, we have the uh, Feast of Pentecost, we have the first fruits, and we have the Feast of Pentecost, the Spirit of God. So by the time the church came, four feasts in the spiritual world fulfilled. You can celebrate them, that's fine, you know, knowing that they really occur in Christ. So it's okay, you know, people, some people are quite Jewish orientated, they like to celebrate it, that's fine. But remember, spiritually it really came to pass in Christ. And then we know that the one number seven hasn't come to pass yet, because that is Revelation 21. What about the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement? On November 14, 2012, it was a feast of trumpets. When the seven thunders was released, the feast of trumpets began. And so in the book of um, Revelation, you notice that the seven thunders was right towards the end of the blowing of the trumpets between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet was the seven thunders. The sixth trumpet was in chapter 9 of Revelations, verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded. Remember the blowing of the trumpets. And then the seventh trumpet was chapter 11, verse 15. The seventh angel sounded and the kingdom of God became the kingdom of the Lord. So the blowing of the trumpets must complete before the Feast of Tabernacles. And 
in the midst of the sixth to the seventh trumpet is chapter 10 verse 4 the seven thunders so the feast of trumpets was so important that occasion the day when the seven thunders was released even though it's very few people in the human world do you know the whole universe was watching I repeat again the whole universe there's a stillness in the whole universe. Human witnesses, very few. Some say, wow, you know, can be such a great event. Okay, let me ask you another question. When Jesus was actually born the first Christmas, how many witnesses were there? Because okay, they were Mary, Joseph, the innkeeper, not too busy, just give them the farm area, <laughs> the animals. I don't think the innkeeper was there. No records. The three wise men only came later. They, by the time they reached, it was a little child in a house. Because there are only two fellows, poor thing, correct? The event of the universe! The humans were all busy buying, selling, you know, marrying, giving my children. Again, busy, busy, busy. So God looked around. Of course, the angels don't look like that. Look around, you know. Because they don't have spiritual binoculars. Anyone? No humans they could speak to. You remember how many angels are involved? So many! Only two humans. So in the end they saw, ah, there's a group of people who are not so busy. Got a lot of free time. Sheep all asleep. So they went to the shepherds. And they said, Today, great day! That's happened. Whatever. And the shepherd said, huh, huh. Right? Because they never see angel before. I assume. I don't think any of the shepherds were struck by lightning 11 years old. Or had open vision. So I assume that was the first time they see angel. Huh? And then after the angel announced, suddenly their eyes were open, they saw. A whole group of angels, tens upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands. And it impacted so much, they said to one another, Hey, we better go and check out this event. So, the other shepherd, his name could be Akka. Akka <laughs> said, What about a sheep? Then he looked over. Yeah, my la, she, she was sleeping. Huh? After all, Eddie said, Watch the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> They watch the ship, so I said, no need now. And so, they all, whole small group, just a small group probably less than one hand. They all went there all the way. While well, the whole town was busy, they went and see. Ah. And all they saw was a little baby. So, a universal event. Universal. Where all heaven was watching. The birth of Jesus. Human being only a few. Seven thunders. The whole universe was watching. And when it was delayed, when it was delivered, the heavens say, seal and says, it is done. The feast of trumpets began. Now what is the feast of trumpets? When the feast of trumpets was blown on the first day of the seventh month, it means that in 10 days time is the most important day of the year. The most important day of the year in all of Israel is the Day of Atonement, when the priest goes into the into most holy place. And when they hear the sound, do, 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 say, how long did they go in? Oh, they are. Oh, they are. Blowing on the trumpet, on and on. The whole nation. And they know. Ten days more to atonement. Everyone start getting ready. Call the holiness. Preparing themselves. The moment the seven thunders was delivered on November 14, 2012, the countdown to the rapture and second coming takes place. The rapture and the second coming 
I auto incense, number 5 and 6. Rapture and second coming represent the feast of, uh, the, the delivery of the seven thunders was the feast of trumpets. The atonement and the second, atonement and second coming represent the day of atonement. See, the rapture you're taken in your flesh into seven heaven. Everyone who is alive during the rapture, they go inside. Or you're worshipping. About a week of worship. Go imagine. Now, sometimes future knowledge alters us. So some people say, well, since a week, eh, I will come on the seventh day. <laughs> you know, human beings. Well, we do not know when the time comes, what it's like. But it will be the worship. And then you thought, oh, I'll come on the seventh day. And then God also know people's thinking. So you actually start the week after the week. <laughs> and then you're worshiping. Hey, when? Uh? Worshiping. Hey, when? Uh? Worshiping. Hey, when? Uh? You keep asking. And then the longer you ask, also extra. Extra, extra. Then the one week drag into 21 minutes. <laughs> God knows. But we worship until we forgot when. We worship until we say, Lord, this is it. We just, we are not waiting. Of course, some of you panic and say, hey, do we still eat a seven days worship? <laughs> Remember the glorious church? By that time, I don't need to eat that much. <laughs> you might just take one piece of bread, cut it to 100 pieces. <laughs> ah, I'm full! <laughs> <laughs> you might take one red bean, chop into half. One for you, one for me. Oh, I'm full! You may have well know. You know, it might be supernaturally and built. Remember, Elijah took two meals, lasted for 40 days and 40 nights. So you chop, 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 that one meal, the small little parts, wow, it will be very tiny just for one day. So it's powerful. We never know, there are things that we cannot imagine as we come nearer to the glorious church. I am the supernatural energy of God. Remember Jesus go 40 days, 40 nights without food and water. Remember Moses, 40 days and 40 nights, three times without food and water. The glory of God was there. So you enter into it. Your seven days might just feel like five minutes. You'll be so caught up in it. And you will thought that it's just seven minutes, maybe seven days. And you won't be hungry. Whatever, one time you worship, don't be hungry. But Slowly, we are getting there. So all these long services, long message, long honor prayer, <laughs> training. <laughs> all training until we love the presence of God. And so we have that in the day of atonement. The countdown has begun. Everything is seven plus seven plus seven plus seven plus seven. It's the blowing of the feast of trumpet prepare you for that day. The announcing of the seven thunders, everyone was now prepared for the glorious church and the rapture. That is not our goal. Whatever, you know, long term goal, short term goal, everything must not align. The glorious church and the rapture. That's all from the seven thunders. And as we look at all these places here, here's the interesting thing. This is like the DNA of all that God is doing in the human race. When this revelation was given to Moses and then later imbued into the tabernacle of Solomon. This pattern. So that even when God revived our modern church, we have our mini revival when the church towards the end. When Martin Luther, you know the seven church ages, when Martin Luther starts again announcing what was his key thing? The just shall live by faith. It was like we learned about the Passover all over again. That the Passover, the atonement was sufficient. And then immediately after the time of Martin Luther, we discovered the printing press and the word was translated into the common language of people. And the Bible started being spread. It was like the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The power of the written word spread all over. It 
was like the feast of unlimited bread. We have a mini feast of unlimited bread revival. And then, we went to the evangelism. Missionaries started. Because they know only by the gospel can people be saved, then automatically you will have evangelism. If you don't know the way of salvation, how can you evangelize? Then as the printed word go up, we have evangelism. First fruits. People going, evangelism, missionaries. All started going, growing. Now you got the you got the, the, the gospel, you got the, the Bible, then you got evangelism. And as we go forth, the feast of first fruits. And we have our Pentecost. We even call it Pentecost. Today denominations are called up a Pentecostal church. We have our Pentecost in 1906. In the outpouring at Azula Street, we have our mini Pentecost. All those things still continue. We have our Pentecost. And my brethren, we have our Feast of Trumpets. And this Feast of Trumpets and this Seven Thunders revelation and knowledge will be announced to the whole world. In a super growth, years of 2022 to 2026, the whole world will hear about the seven pandas. To prepare for the coming of Jesus. The rapture and the coming to the earth. Everything is all set. Which is why in this series of Faith for the Rapture, we're talking about learning not this level of faith, how to believe God for your car, believe God for your house, believe God for your salary, believe. By all means, this is okay. We didn't say it's not okay. We have to go beyond this. We have to learn to believe God for the rapture or to be translated to be living our life without sickness and disease. And then we move into this level where we learn to have faith for others. But the real rapture faith is learning how to have faith to enter into the Holy of Holies. To handle the holy things of God. And I say I give a few examples before we end. Now, this one just introduces a new subject. Wow, faith. For the things of the holy thing. I mean that should be another series title of the question another time. Faith for holy. Let me show you here. In the book of Leviticus chapter 16, God shows them, or God instructed the priest about how to enter his most holy place. He spent it in, in the Bible, it was so long that it's listed like entire chapter. The Day of Atonement got one whole chapter about it. It was so particular and so detailed. What the priest has to do, he has to take uh, the young bull as a sin offering in Leviticus 16. He has to take uh, uh, the goats and, uh, and everything, all this detail, and then the bull for sin offering. And then it says, after all those things in verse 12, those other things before verse 12 will take almost the whole day. Then in verse 12 it says, Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord. And that is the altar of incense. That is the altar before the Lord. So in verse 12, He shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord. With his hands full of sweet incense, beaten fire. Then he got a censer, and the censer, is where they, they put the, 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 the perfume they, from the cloud incense and it says he must put it um, and bring it inside the veil and this is what happened, it was 13 he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that's on the testimony lest he die lest he die Notice, and he went to sprinkle seven times inside. So the main thing that covered him was a cloud of incense. That's why now we know the rapture has worship. 
And not only that, we have a cherub come down to teach us to worship. Not inbuilt into our Marquis And he has to learn how to tap on the union. And so this, so the imagine the priest, so pretend that's the most holy place. Before he entered the veil, he got everything ready. He got only a few minutes. Why do you think the incense so good that lasts a long time? Slowly takes time. Da 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 seven times. Da 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 da. Chip chip. Then the insect disappeared. He found his face facing the up on the covenant. He would die. Oh, before the insect. And those of you who who have ever played around with incense or perfume, you know, it doesn't last forever. I doubt it lasts for an hour, unless there's a lot. But that's only what one man can carry. You know, the priest didn't take a big chunk. Wow, his, his sensor was so big. And then the priest was a muscular man, everyday training, to carry, you know, uh, 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 50 kilograms on one hand. <laughs> and, then it, and it lasts a long time. No, this, it, the sensor is very really small. It was a few minutes, maybe seconds. And then as they put it and the sensor has to be good quality. After you know some cheapskate thing, you know, compromise the guy, you put the, the sense, the, the clock on Instagram, chew, oh, finish. Then cover him. Finish, he dies. And so he has to put the incense, the cloud covers him. Then while the clock covers you go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and quickly come out. Sprinkle it around. Covered by the incense. So it was a holy day. That, was the, that would be the most frightening and at the same time most exciting day of his life. So what would you do if you were the high priest? I know what I would do. When the priest of trumpet sound, what well, you start getting ready. Really tip top form. Right? So you'd be passive. You have to be fit. Cannot be slow. You have to be very fit to go in and do it. Don't forget, you're gonna do all the animal sacrifices. And so he learns how to do that. And Moses knows about that. He knew about these holy things of God. And here in number 16, same, same number but different book. In number 16, there was an occasion when there was a rebellion. In number 16, there was a rebellion. And in the rebellion, Korah and his group died. The earth opened up and swallowed him. In chapter 16, verse 35, fire, we have book a number, chapter 16, verse 35, fire came out from the Lord, consumed 250 men who were offering the incense. God didn't accept their offering. They all died on the spot. And uh, then the plague started. And uh, then after that, the plague started. It was 41. Because the next day, the congregation complained. They said, You kill the people! Whoa. Imagine how hard that they were. So sometimes the holy things of God can get familiar. Which is why we must never take it for granted. And, uh, and when one day was there, I forgot which day, oh yeah, just the, the, the week before I went to Australia. So I fasted three days uh, on top of my normal fast. So that week, oh, I only got two days to eat. So I ordered to eat meat. And so uh, on Monday, I fasted uh, to, Thursday is already dedicated to fast. So Friday is dedicated to fast for the church. So Thursday is a fast of Thanksgiving for translation. So Monday I had a fast to thank God for all the uh, revelations that's given. And Tuesday was a fast for it. I think it's three days of Thanksgiving fast. Then on Wednesday, which is a download day, I had a download day and I broke my fast that day uh, in, in, your, in your dad's house. Uh, and I said, no, uh, I cannot uh, fast a full day because 
I'm with the Sabbath Tanders Prophet, we must eat meat. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we will go out and eat. And we went out and you know, bak chow me or something like that. And uh, so and uh, so I decided to fast and had no food right until uh, then I brought some uh, of you know fried bananas and fried things. And so before I broke, you would see that I was silent and I was talking to God personally. Because Wednesday fast was a fast asking God, saying, God, I thank you for what the angels have done. And that fast was, God, I ask you, Father, I don't know how you're going to do it, but Father, I want to thank you for the angels and our angels. And I fast so that you will bless and reward all these angels. If there's a such thing as reward, which I don't know what else you can reward that. And it was a thanksgiving fast to say, thank you for these angels, please bless them. So it was a fast to appreciate the angels. Appreciate all that they have done. Appreciate their hard work and their patient work with us. And so hey, the angels appreciate that. Because we are all not self, we are all not so selfish, we always receive, receive, receive. Oh angels download, download, angels help me, help me, help me, angels, strengthen me, strengthen me. Well the angel may working in your life since your baby. Until now, still got to change your diapers. So I had one day, uh, at least most of the day or half the day, to say, God, I thank you for the angel. I'm now fasting for them. I know, yeah, 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 I know and they don't need us. We need that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, you know, that uh, that uh, they didn't ask us to fast for them, and there's no scripture to say fast for the angels. <coughs> but I wanted to just do that as a thanksgiving to God. Because how do I bless my angel back? I can't. We are made a little lower than the angels. But I can ask God the Father to bless them. The Father, this is my thank you to you. Could you please reward all this of my, you know, in a sense, bigger family members who are more advanced than us at this moment because of our physical limitation. Bless them, reward them. And you know why I did that? Because I get so familiar with the angels and they're close to us. And I told them this on that day. I will never take you for granted. I will never take my angels that were with me for granted. So don't you dare take the things of God for granted. Don't become so familiar that you say, ah, yes, and, you know, and then you wake up the angel and say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, you're there, yeah, I'm so used to you. Never. Every day is precious people. We must never lose our sense of the awesomeness of God. If you lose it, you might lose some things in your life. Korah became too familiar. So all these people. And so these people, you can imagine how can they? They saw the earth open up. They saw fire came out and killed all these people. Not Moses. But they came and said, Moses, you killed these people. And when they happened, God was, God showed His anger. Boom, the whole place was filled with God's glory. And God says, Move aside! I'm going to consume that for You know, how to do with the Holy God? When the Holy God is angry, what will you do? Most of us will say, Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Moses didn't do that. He has dealt with the angry God before. Things which most of us don't even dare to face. He has seen God and his anger. And when he saw that, he said that God is not even talking anymore. God is consuming and people are dying like flies. The, the fire of God goes... People die like flies. If you only have faith for your own things, you're gone also. If you only got faith to pray for the people but not before God, also God, your faith cannot handle this. This is something your faith cannot handle. But Moses' faith had increased. He has prayed and interceded before God. How? You learn at the place of worship and prayer, correct? People who pray to God and say, God, spare your people. 
Moses even offered himself. He put himself between God said, Moses, I will take you and start a whole new nation. And Moses said, Blot my name from the book of life. He offered himself as a sacrifice. If you want to do that, take me too. What good. He knew how to pray. He knew how to exercise faith before God. And he has saw God answers his prayer. And God wanted to destroy Aaron. Because Moses prayed, he spared Aaron. So he has been walking at the altar of incense before God. And when that happened, before God, when they die like flies, this is when Moses, God never said that said to God. Nobody teach him. Maybe the angel was teaching him also, but maybe wisdom was coming upon him. Because Moses had a spirit of wisdom. Because the Bible says, when he laid hands on Joshua, Joshua, the spirit of wisdom that was on Moses came upon him. So he had this wisdom. Remember what the two churches here? Sadis, Philadelphia. Life when you have the life of God, God respect life and wisdom. Philadelphia, angel of wisdom. When he came before God, he told Aaron, he said in verse 46, Aaron says, wow, the, God was consuming the people. It was going on. The people were dying. So he quickly go to Aaron and say, Aaron, would you take a censer in verse 46? Take a censer, put fire on it, and put the incense, you know the same incense that goes inside. The same incense, the one that in Leviticus 6, where you take it, that can protect you from God's presence, that can kill you. So his wisdom, they take the same censer and, uh, and they put fire on it and, uh, and quickly uh, go between the people and God. Go take the censer and remember God was consuming. And, and Aaron had to quickly, and the Bible said he has to run. Because every second that he was slow could be another thousand lives. God, you think God consumed very slow? <laughs> no! It was... People were dying like flies. And so there were three million there. They could all be wiped out if they're too slow. If they slowly did that. Tra-la-la, tra-la-la. Oh, and no, 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 one million and die. And so, he has to put the sensor and in those days, they don't wear jeans or pants like us. They could run very far. Long skirts. Aaron, Aaron was dressed as a high priest. And the bells around him, oh my God, click it, click it, click it. I tell you, the bells are very fast that day. Click it, click it, click it. If I even had gone to the supersonic that is. <laughs> so, they were moving that fast in his skirt. And he had to run very fast. Have you seen the olden days when they wear when they wear long long skirts? Even the Chinese wear long skirts. They all the long skirts. When they run, you saw how the Chinese run in the movies. They pick up their skirt and go. <laughs> <laughs> but he can't. Both his hands are being used. So one sensor, one or the other. You have to have an extra sensor. You have to put the sensor there, and you have to run with his skirt, and then he go before God. Go. He got to go. In front of God, and the presence of God, and he was the holy censer, and with the censer still having the insects, and then it's tells us in the Bible, Aaron stood between the people and God. He had to put himself between them. I tell you, when he stood there, he was trembling. Good thing his bladder control was good. <laughs> 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 He's been urinating on the spot. <laughs> so he stands between you and God. Oh, oh, you know, I need to make sure you have insect. I think the insect will oh, come in. Ah, ah, ah. Oh, if the insect fire not heat enough, then the cold go on. And the blue insects. And the insects have to go up between you and God. And it's too. And he was there standing and trembling. He stopped the play. <laughs> Who teach Moses? Wisdom. How to handle the holy things of God. 
Because here is the thing. God will honor his own word. God will honor his people who are called. God will honor his anointing. Which is why here's the thing about exercising faith for the most holy. Whether you're seven thunders prophet, called to be like I said, or me, cause an apostle in his end time. We have to be careful of every single word we say. The office we carry. Remember Elisha? I don't know. When he freshly got the anointing on him, he got two times the anointing of Elijah. But physically, <laughs> he might not be as handsome as Pastor David. <laughs> and Pastor David has said good things about him. <laughs> <laughs> he was born. <laughs> so in the book of Second Kings, a group of naughty boys disturbed him. Bohe, bohe, bohe. Remember? Which translated into Malay is Botahe, Botahe. <laughs> they always disturb in schools in Malaysia. Botahe, Botahe. And Elisha was walking. He got angry. Turn around. Curse them. And then he walked up. And the Bible tells us. The naughty little boys, I think they're not that little boy, they're quite big. After they were cursed, Elisha went, they all go home, you know. Oh, we disturbed that funny fellow. A big bad kid. Ah! <laughs> you know the best in the claw. I tell you, faster than the samurai sword. You know how fast sometimes the movies the samurai sword. You know they and then the person goes into a half. You know, then they don't show the part the sock coming out, putting in. They get like it's so fast you cannot see with your eye. So the back come up. <laughs> all the pieces fall over the place. <laughs> they die because of one curse from the man of God. Here is the thing. I don't think there was special instruction to curse that. Right? But it was initiated. And so sometimes we can get so familiar. Moses also made one mistake. After that, Moses might have thought, okay, anyway. And then later on, towards the end of the book of Numbers, when the people still complaining, we want water, we want water. They have water all the time. Now one more time, no water. And then God says, alright, speak to the rock. Water will come out. So Moses, oh, he was upset. He had a temper too. So he came before the people with a rod. And said, you rebels! Why oh, he was angry. Yeah, you want me to ask the big water out of this rock? <coughs> and the water still come out. The people got to drink the water. But he go back. God says, Moses, Tanbu Bali Kutu. No, my wife's full name is. <laughs> so some people say when, when when God calls you by your full name or when somebody calls you by your full name, then it's really really time to really you know. Because before they get Moses, Moses. Now this you know Moses, Levi, Bathsheba, Yahweh, whatever. Come here. Yes. You didn't sanctify me. Because of that, you will not go into the promised land. Ah! You could have heard the scream for longer than another camp. <laughs> another camp. And that was horrified. And the Bible tells us in the book, you know, keep, he keeps asking God, please stop the people. Because he, he very famous for interceding. Until one day God says, Don't talk to me anymore about this. Because even some things Moses cannot cross the line. Now, why did Moses cross the line? Why did Elisha curse the people? Anger. Anger comes from your soul. So, the emotions, the intellect, all this must be fine-tuned in God so that we don't abuse the things of God's holiness. So it's important for us to understand how to how to flow with God to continue to do things to understand how the blessings of God flow. 
which is important for us to understand. And this is where I really got permission from, from Timotheus to use that. That when you know when there was a pronouncement and then he he missed uh, he, he second generation but missed the rapture. So I pray the Lord showed me there is still a way how to handle the holy things of God. And part of the thing is make sure you go through your thing, then you are a symbol of blessing of this So the spirit of wisdom says. When you bless him, that cancels that. And you're back on track. It won't be so. So make sure this time, pick up your skirts and really drink. Because now the rapture is so important. It might not look so important now, but when you wish a glorious church that every possibility of being in that is tremendously important. See, we flow with what God has established. And God has established certain things and we understand how to have faith. He's still having faith in what God revealed. And I tell you, when you use your faith to do what God has revealed, God is pleased. When He sent Moses out with a censor, God must have looked at his angels and said, My boy has learned how to deal with me. Yes. He knew how to handle the holiness of God. He stopped the plane. Stop the plane. So here is the, the, the avenue I open to you as we as we come to the conclusion. To show you there's more in the realm of faith. That when you walk with God, there are faith people who could exercise God for a lot of things natural and you think that is great faith. That's just introduction of the God faith. Not to make small of that. I mean, in the world, millions of dollars, billions of dollars, still, still, still a lot. That will come. Remember, that greater faith will always cover this faith. Seek you first the kingdom of God. And this is nothing to you. That is righteousness. This will be added to you. Then, when we have faith to heal people, faith such that you got a thousand people and you go, receive the anointing, poof! And a thousand people fall in the power, receive and get baptized in the spirit. We think, oh, that's fantastic faith. And we go, oh, wow, so powerful. Not powerful yet. Powerful in the ties of man. Oh, yeah, a hundred blind people heal at the same time. Be open and all heal. This is still in the dimension of faith for people. The rapture faith, the highest faith, is you know how to enter the Holy of Holies. You could walk in and out. And I can tell you a few people who do that. Moses, who saw the back parts of God's glory. Elijah, who says, I am Elijah, who stands in the presence of God. See, he's always there. He's always in the Holy of Holies. Here's the thing. Why didn't Elijah mean it? I think his own emotions, negative emotions. Although he got anointed, he died sick. That kind of anointing cannot get sick, man. Look, Moses never got sick. Elijah, Elijah never got sick. He got twice the anointing of Elijah. Because somehow cannot flow in the parts of the soul. Enoch, he walked with God and was not. But remember, Enoch started walking with God when he had his first child at the age of 65. He walked with God 300 years. So he was taken at 365. Somehow when he had a new child, something says, I must get closer to God. When he saw the life, he, something changed him. And he made him walk closer with God. Doesn't matter. He started walking with God 65 years old. Some of you say, oh, too late now. I'm now 70 something. Hey, Moses started at 80. Anyone above 80 here? See, oh, young! They start walking with God closely. What must it do to you, and what must happen in your life to make you have faith to walk closely with God? The birth of a child, something happened in your life, then 
The best is you have come to know God and there's a deep hunger. A hunger that no food can meet. A hunger that all the money and gold and silver in the world cannot satisfy. A hunger that all the gifts of the Spirit or you become the most famous person on the earth in the kingdom of God cannot satisfy. And I can tell you, all those don't satisfy. A hunger that can only be satisfied when you come to see God face to face. And you know God like no human being else know God. That is the rapture faith. They have to be imparted to the second generation. That your hunger for God, to know this God, to know our Father, to know Christ, to know the Holy Spirit. And you learn from all our trainers, the angels are our trainers, and our helpers, and our guides, our guardians. Learn from them as much. If someone appointed a tuition teacher to you, a tuition teacher, you would like to learn. So don't underestimate the work of your angels. Help the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works through the angels also. You learn from all. Thank God for extra tuition. As far as I know, your tuition is different from your school. All right. Your school got teacher. Then you got tuition. Say, Why need tuition? I, I, my teacher teach me. Man, t- tuition help you because you, there's some things you miss. If you know everything, then of course you don't need tuition. Then, then you and the Holy Spirit go walk, walk along. That's it. But none of us are perfect. We miss God here and there. The angels come, extra, got the extra tuition, teach us here. Because they have been walking with the Holy Spirit for billions of years. Learn from them. Don't take them for granted. Don't look down on them. They are masters in learning about the Holy Spirit. Sensitive to them. They already have been tested in the great rebellion of Satan. When they are sent to us, be grateful you got tuition. Some people cannot afford tuition. <laughs> God bless you with angel to tutor you, to guide you, stand with you, work well with you. They can help you. So this is the rapture faith the God wants to raise. Let's all raise our faith level. By all means, be blessed in the natural by all means, have faith in operating the gifts and authority of Christ. But learn to walk God. Learn the holiness of God. Walk closely with the holiness of God. And handle the holy things of God. Have the love of Christ, the heart of Christ. Reach out. And don't let things slack in your life. Let's go to God. Father, we thank you. For your grace and your mercy that you establish. We thank you, Father, that you are able to do great and wonderful things. When Joshua stopped the sun, he was guided, but it was initiated by him. He has learned to handle authority in the right way and not misuse it. And the great men and women in the Bible whom you have raised will learn to operate your power under your holiness without abusing but everything exactly as your will to use your power whom you have delegated to us to use your authority and anointing that you delegated unto us to further the work of your kingdom to further the establishment of the will of God on earth and never to use it for our own selfish ends. Teach us. Teach us this holiness so that we will never abuse authority and power. So that, Father, you can trust us with your power. We are so sorry that there are so few human. You have trusted angels with your power. Those who fail, you have already condemned them. And we are so sorry, Father, that among humans, the reason why we don't see great power in your church, great signs and wonders, is because there are so few of us who could trust with the power 
that will grant us the opportunity to be full of faith. So, Father, we present ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. We lay down our soul, our spirit, our body. We lay down our intellect, our emotions, and our volition and free will. We lay it all down. We choose to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And our only reason to live, besides to worship you, to love you, our only reason to exist is to do your will. Like Jesus, we say, we have come to this world to fulfill the volume of the book written about the church, about Jesus. We have come to do your will. And we will not sidetrack to the left or right. We are born servants sealed to only do your will. And where you give us a choice of our will and your will, consistently, persistently, we will choose your will. Even if it hurts us, even if it costs us, even if we have to give our lives to die, we will choose your will. Like Stephen, who choose to do your will at the cost of everything in his life. Father, here we are. Send us. Take us. Receive us as an offering. And we pray that you find among those who are hearing this message in your church here, in the church in Sydney, among the people who will be joining our church in the hundreds of thousands and millions in the coming years, that you will find a group of people who will say, Father, your will be done and not our will. Even if we have to walk the road of the cross with Jesus and with the bad thorns of From our first breath to our last breath, your will be done, my Father, and not our will. Establish it in our life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's all rise together. <coughs> Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, remember, you can reach the heights of God. Whether you're young or you're old, you can reach to the heights of God. There is no problem to be. God cannot solve it. There is no problem. There is, there is no mountain to talk. He cannot move it. There is no storm to die. God cannot come There is no sorrow.
or one, we all have been through. Doesn't matter how many sins their people have done, doesn't matter how many times they've fallen, doesn't matter how perfect or how imperfect, that each one will rise by the power of your spirit, by the power of your blood, by the power of your anointing, by the power given by your faith in us and your gift of faith to rise to be truly sons and daughters of God in Christ Jesus. Father, raise up a new generation. Generation that will be part of your glorious church. Raise up a new generation. A generation that will be worthy Wash by the blood to see your glory and the rapture. Yes, Lord, we thank you, Father. Seal this into our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's give Jesus a good clap.